All right, let's get started. We're running behind. Um, if folks can take any conversations out in the hall, it would be great. As I call to order the ISFMP Policy Board, so welcome. Good morning. Um, we had uh, our executive committee meeting ran over just a little bit. Um, for those of you that aren't on the executive committee, I'll be giving a report on the executive committee meeting at the business session today. I think it's today, Bob. Or no, Bob's not here yet. Today. Business sessions after what? This meeting. After this meeting. So we'll have a discussion on various things. Um, and I'll wait for Bob to get here for the other. Um, so you have your agenda um, in front of you, um, as well as the proceedings from our May 2014 meeting. Um, is there any concerns or objectives of moving forward with our agenda and approving the minutes from our May meeting? Seeing none, those stand approved. Um, this is an opportunity for public comment. This is for items that are not on the agenda. Um, I see one hand in the back. Are there others that wish to address the ISFMP Policy Board? If not, if you would come to the microphone and state your name, any organization you might represent, and uh, have your say. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm David Frula for the Fisheries Survival Fund, um, the organization representing the limited access scallop fleet on the East Coast. I wanted to check to see if you would prefer to have comment relating to the special management zones off Delaware now or during that segment of your meeting. Yeah, let's do that during the segment of the meeting, Dave, if you don't mind. No, not at all. Thank okay, you. thank you. Just remind me and raise your hand again and or come up here and hit me in the head if I forget, okay? All right, anything else? Nobody else can do that. Um, anybody else from the public? I didn't see any other hands up. If not, we'll move right into our agenda. Uh, the first item is a review of our stock rebuilding performance. Um, Tony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to go through our annual review of the stock rebuilding performance. Uh, there was, a, on your CD briefing materials, there was the overview of all of our species and how we're doing, as well as a memo that talked about um, some definitions that we are proposing to use that go along with the stock rebuilding performance document and our status of the stocks. I will read those definitions as I go through to make sure that the board um, is co uh, confident in those definitions. We had a little bit of um, wordsmithing the last time we talked about these, so I want to make sure that everybody <laughs> is um, approves of these new definitions. Um, as, as you all know, this is part of our strategic planning um, and a task in the 2014 action plan. And the objective of doing the review each year is to validate the status and the rate of progress that we're doing in our species management plans. And if the progress that we're making is not acceptable to the policy board, we, the policy board should be identifying corrective action. And those could mean having direct feedback to the different species management boards on how to take action to um, move forward with individual species management plans. It also provides staff with input into the 2015 action planning process. So we have five categories. Um, there is one category that is, we've sort of changed the name, and that is rebuilding, and we've called it now viable slash rebuilding based on um, updates or feedback from the policy board. We also have rebuilt, concern, depleted, and unknown. So for rebuilt, uh, we're defining this as a stock biomass is equal to or above the biomass level set by the FMP to ensure population sustainability. The stock is still rebuilt if it drops below the target but remains above the threshold. And for a viable stock, those are stocks that exhibit stable or increasing trends. Biomass is approaching the target level set by the FMP to ensure population sustainability. So for the stocks that are rebuilt, it includes Gulf of Maine and GBK lobster, herring, sea bass, bluefish, scup, Spanish mackerel, spiny dogfish, and summer flounder. The viable slash rebuilding stock is red drum. 
For stocks of concern, stocks of concern are those that are developing emerging issues, which could include increased effort, declining landings, or impacts due to environmental conditions. Um, Atlantic Croker uh, is currently not, ex it's a stock of, these are the stocks that are all of concern, not experiencing overfishing, that the biomass is increasing and F is decreasing. Um, Biomass is unknown um, in the assessment due to the uncertainty in the shrimp trawl discards, although there was just a recent workshop on discards that was conducted by CDAR, and we'll be using that to help inform the Croker management plan. And the South Atlantic Board is also considering an addendum that looks at a traffic light approach to monitoring the stocks outside of the assessment time period um, and that would be an update to the current trigger mechanism that we have previously used. Atlantic Menhaden, over, um, overfishing is occurring, but it's unknown if the stock is overfished. We're um, exploring uncertainty in the assessment through the benchmark that will be completed this winter. The board set interim reference points that would increase SSB and availability for ecosystem services, as well as established the first TAC in 2013 that works towards ending overfishing, and we were under that TAC um, in 2013. Striped bass is not overfished and overfishing is not occurring. The SSB is approaching the overfish threshold, and this is from the 2013 assessment. We should be moving along here. Keep going. Um, Projections show that the SSB will likely fall below the threshold due to poor year classes from 2005 to 2010, and the advice from the technical committee is to reduce F across all sectors, and there is an addendum that was just approved for public comment that looks at doing so. Um, coastal sharks, um, the overfishing and overfish status varies by species. Our FMP complements the federal regulations. The TC had a um, general concern that the um, fin to carcass ratio may create a loophole um, because different states um, retain different sets of fins um, for spiny dogfish, but the board has initiated a draft addendum to actually remove the fin to carcass ratio, which would be consistent with the um, Shark Conservation Act and will be considered um, later this week. For horseshoe crab, there is different trends um, in the status of the stock. We don't have a coastwide assessment, but the New England and New York region, um, the trends in the population seem to be declining, whereas the Delaware Bay and the southeast trends seem to be um, increasing. The board is still trying to solve an issue with um, the biomedical data and in order to use them in regional assessments due to some confidentiality issues in including that data within the regions due to the low number of biomedical companies within each region. Uh, we set a precautionary cap on har harvest, and with the loss of the um, abundant, we have a loss of an abundance index without the dedicated horseshoe crab trawl survey. Um, for spotted sea trout, there's no coastwide assessment planned or recommended by um, the plan review team, but we do have state stock assessments that um, are close to or slightly above their SPR goals um, in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. But these assessments would benefit from additional fishery independent abundance indices, improved discard information, and additional biological samplings of the fisheries. Um, the Omni bus that we approved in 2011 includes recommended management measures to help protect spawning stock biomass. Um, for winter flounder at Gulf of Maine, the last stock assessment was not accepted, so there's no F and SSB target generated, although they did put together a proxy F and found that overfishing was not occurring. In 2014 and 13, we maintained um, the same measures through the commission. Um, NOAA Fisheries increased their um, state water subcomponent in 2012 to 272 metric tons and then maintained that um, 
state water subcomponent through 2014. Uh, depleted, the definition we're using for depleted is reflects low levels of abundance through, though it is unclear whether fishing mortality is the primary cause for the reduced stock size. And I'll go through the depleted species. For American eel, the trend analysis shows that the stock is declining and it's at or near low levels. There's decreasing trends in some of the river systems for the yellow eel stages. And there are significant fisheries that are still occurring. The most recent Addendum 3 um, addresses some of the concerns that the TC had. It approved a 9-inch size limit, reduced the recreational bag, and has restrictions on pigmented eels. The current addendum that we are discussing tomorrow will also look at um, possible quotas for the... Or for the uh, glass eels as well as the yellow eels and then measures for the silver, silver eel fishery. Um, and then the technical committee has also um, recommended improving passage to help um, the eel. The American lobster southern New England stock is at 58% of its SSB target, although overfishing is not occurring. These is the lowest levels of abundance since the 1980s. Um, there was a draft addendum that was approved um, and reduced exploitation by 10%. The Lobster Board had a report on the um, how well those um, that 10% reduction had did and not all the LCMAs met that reduction and the board is going to review plans from the LCMTs that did not meet the reduction in November. We also have approved trap cuts for area two and three which will be implemented in 2016. For American Shad, um, it uh, varies, the trends in the fisheries did, varies by um, river system. Currently we do not have an assessment scheduled, um, but all of the states have put in um, sustainable fishery management plans as well as um, habitat plans. Um, for northern shrimp, the stock is overfished and overfishing is occurring. Um, the section closed the shrimp fishery due to its poor status in 2014 for the first year. Um, and the section has approved an addendum that includes management tools to slow catch rates for northern shrimp and is exploring an amendment that will look at limited entry as well as some other, is other management issues. Um, in the upcoming year. For river herring, um, river herring is depleted or at historic lows. The overfishing status is unknown. Most of the uh, state surveys are, or river surveys are flat or decreasing. Um, and a lot of the available run estimates are decreasing. The states have approved sustainable fishery management plans as well as most states have submitted and the board has approved habitat plans as well. Uh, the, tech, the River Herring Technical Expert Working Group, which is a joint effort by the Commission and NOAA Fisheries, um, is looking at identifying conservation efforts, critical data gaps, monitoring and evaluating progress towards rebuilding. And NOAA has put forward um, a large sum of money to help fund projects that will address some of these data gaps. And Marin is going to talk about that a little bit more later today. For Tatog, we're at 39% of the SSB. Overfishing is occurring, and the states have implemented regulations to achieve the target F. And we have a benchmark assessment that is ongoing and should be ready for the board review um, early next year. Weak fish, um, there hasn't been really any changes in, in weak fish. Based on the results of the assessment, um, the Weak fish, weak fish stock is at very low levels. Um, there is going to be an assessment that will be addressed next year. Um, and the board annually assesses the stock status using indicators to monitor the population until the assessment is completed. 
for um, winter flounder, southern New England um, mass, it's uh, or mid-Atlantic, sorry, it's overfished, but overfishing is not occurring. We followed the TC's advice and established low limits to discourage a directed fishery and dead discards, and there is no assessment um, scheduled currently. For the unknown species, their definition is there is no accepted stock assessment to estimate the stock status. And we have three species listed. Sturgeon, um, it's at low abundance. Uh, we need river-specific abundance estimates and better bycatch information. There are four DPSs that are listed as endangered and one is threatened. And the benchmark assessment um, is scheduled to be completed in 2015. And we will have a report out on that um, later today as well. For black drum, we have an assessment that is currently ongoing and will be completed um, this winter. The FMP was approved in 2013 and put together some minimum management measures until we have an assessment to consider. And lastly, we have spot. Um, there are um, some unfavorable data trends in the spot fishery. The commercial landings have been declining. The commercial catch at age data, which showed an expansion of the age structure in the early 2000s, has started to contract in the last several years. The length at age and weight at age have decreased um, for ages one and three. And the distribution of the trophy citations of the recreational catch of spot have decreased over the last several years. And that is all of our species. And again, I'm looking to make sure that the definitions that have been listed um, meet the needs of the policy board. Thank you, Tony. Doug, questions or comments for Tony? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I did have a question on uh, what the definition you have in the table for rebuilt and viable. And my, I'll tell you up front, my concern is that you may, uh, you could potentially have someone look at this and say that a stock is rebuilt, viable, and rebuilding. And that's because <clears throat> the way I see it, and maybe you can explain if I'm misreading this, uh, rebuilt is when the stock biomass is equal to or above the biomass level. Uh, but it then goes on to clarify and say a stock is still considered rebuilt if it drops below the target but remains above the threshold. Um, under viable rebuilding, it says viable stocks exhibit a stable increasing trend, so they're stable or going up, um, and the stock biomass biomass is approaching the target level, so you're assuming it's above the, both of those cases could be um, um, between the, the uh, target and threshold of the biomass, but is the difference here that one's declining and the other one, you could have a declining stock that's rebuilt? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, we, I added that caveat to the rebuilt because we do have species that have been declared rebuilt, but then their biomass levels start to decrease, and, but they don't come off the rebuilt status until they drop below the threshold. So that's why that sort of caveat was there, and the difference between the viable and rebuilding is that those species have not gotten to that rebuilt status yet. So in theory, the rebuilt species that had dropped below the threshold could be going either direction. It could have dropped and then started to come back up, but it never dropped below the threshold, so it still has that rebuilt declaration to it. So the major distinction here is that viable rebuilding, they've never ever, at least since we've been assessing, them, um, they've never reached a rebuilt status. Or they, let's put it this way, since they dropped below the threshold, they have not gotten up to a rebuilt status. Okay. Correct. Other questions or comments for Tony? Tom? I'm just wondering about what's going to happen with the flounder. And the councils, have they decided whether they're going for the same trip limits as they did last year? Does anybody know? 
Secretary. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, New England Council is about to go through its annual spec setting session, so I could, can't answer your question quite yet. Anybody else? Oh, sorry, Dave. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually have two uh, pretty different uh, points. One is on the definitions that goes back to, to Doug's point. One of my concerns is with the definitions, the way they exist, is that uh, to me, it, I think it sets up the dynamic that, that uh, we um, create an expectation among some of our constituents that we can rebuild some of these stocks when we, we, we don't know if we can. In other words, if we have a depleted stock, and I keep going back and I've, re I've read this uh, uh, definition that um, it's unclear whether fishing mortality is the primary cause for the uh, reduced stock size. It's almost like it, it, that doesn't go far enough, uh, at least in my own mind. For some of these stocks, if, if we just put a whole bunch of scientists in a room and said, can you rebuild this stock, I think there would be a, a debate about whether or not it's, it's possible to rebuild some of these stocks. There's sufficient un uncertainty. So it's almost like we should add something to that uh, that at least lets the public know that it may or may not be possible to rebuild. You know, and I, I'd use weak fish kind of as an example. You know, if we put the best and brightest scientific minds in a room uh, and said, can we rebuild the weak fish stock, I'm not sure that we'd get a, a, an answer to that. So I just ask, ask people to think about that a little bit. And then the other point is I, I want to go back to winter flounder if, if you want to take these separately to Tom's point on winter flounder, if somebody else wants to comment on that. I mean, I, I'm still uncomfortable with where we are with, with winter flounder, the, the, and this isn't a criticism of the council, but we have kind of a disconnect. Uh, that I, I don't think is, is doing either organization uh, value. Uh, the, the council has liberalized the winter flounder regulation in southern New England, and it's because they changed, uh, for valid reasons, they changed some of the assumptions they were, that they were using specifically the rebuilding time period, which allowed the council to liberalize the catch limits, and the commission, on the other hand, hasn't changed its plan. So we have fishermen fishing out of the same port. One fisherman is fishing at a 3,000. If they're in a sector, I think the limit, uh, and the council members can correct this if I, I misspeak, the, the sector representatives are fishing at, at 3,000 pounds, and, the, and the, uh, the state waters fishermen are fishing at 50 pounds. Uh, one side of the line, and the other side of the line, both fishing on the same stock. It's like a disconnect. Uh, and, and somehow we have to sort uh, that out. This isn't the time to do that, but I think we collectively have to figure out a mechanism to bring those two sets of regulations uh, together so they're kind of consistent within the overfishing Requirements. In other words, I'm not talking about liberalizing the regulations or deviating from the overfishing standard. I'm just saying somehow we got to reconcile those differences because I don't think it, it serves our interests or the council's interests. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Doug? Um, to David's first point, one of the things that popped into my head as to when we hear the comment uh, stock cannot be rebuilt is the question has something changed in the environment or um, that the, the target biomass level the ability of a fish to uh, get to a target biomass level has changed in absence of fishing um, there's a, potentially a couple of examples that I could provide of that where the target biomass have changed. I believe one was with yellowtail in a uh, federal stock assessment. I think it was southern New England yellowtail, but I'm, uh, I'll 
maybe uh, uh, my uh, uh, council chairman Terry can help uh, uh, validate that, but that the biomass levels were changed in a peer-reviewed stock assessment to a level, lower level. Um, potentially, we could even argue and uh, make the point with Southern New England lobster where we set a different um, threshold level um, than um, uh, had been there before was a recognition that given environmental conditions or habitat changes, there, in, in the absence of fishing, you may not be able to rebuild to that old level. So the concept that you can't ever rebuild, uh, I think we got to uh, uh, cautiously be cautious about using that statement. It just may be that things have changed in the environment that the rebuilding level has changed. All right. If you want to speak, I need you to raise your hand because I've got a couple of folks on here. I got first. I got Richie, then Walter, then Bill Adler. If anybody else wants to speak, raise your hand, please. Okay. Richie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah. Continue to get down that line of thought. Um, <clears throat> shouldn't we be uh, footnoting uh, the species where this is occurring? Um, you know, not necessarily that it can't be rebuilt. But you know the majority of contribution to the inability to do it, like northern shrimp, is a prime example. You know, we can we can set anything we want in place there, and you're not going to get shrimp if the water doesn't get cold. And <clears throat> so, shouldn't that be uh, when we're listing that? You know, in our in our species, you know, it looks like um, you know our management decisions have. Uh, you know, put that in a situation that, that it's in, and sh shouldn't we be, shouldn't there be more recognition of, <clears throat> you know, that management doesn't have much to do with some of these species? Walter? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was wondering if in instead of having terms for these stock statuses that we maybe would be better off with a numerical scale, the terms are somewhat misleading. You know, rebuilt to somebody may mean, well, woohoo, it's rebuilt. We can fish all we want. Why can't we? Where, you know, shrimp would probably get a zero right now because they're cl it's closed, can't support any fishing. And, and you know, other other fisheries, I mean, there's, there's so many nuances between their statuses that having four or five or whatever we have terms doesn't seem to, to fully describe what what their condition is. Bill Adler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I want to uh, just visit uh, winter flounder, southern New England. I've mentioned this before. Um, when you look at the target thresholds on that particular species, um, I don't know who set the target and the threshold so high and you look at the chart on that, and it's like it's never been there, or it might have been there in the year 1862. I, I'm not sure, but uh, I think that's somewhere in the, um, the goals uh, of winter flounder, southern New England. We probably, somebody should probably take a look at that target and threshold and uh, probably have to bring it down a little. Some of it may have to do with the environmental thing, discussions we just had. But I've seen this forever, it seems, that, oh, yeah, you're overfished, um, and it's because the line is so high, it's almost like you could never reach it. And, and I don't know at what point do we get the scientists to try to say, well, maybe we should bring that down a little to more reality of the past, I don't know how many years. So uh, I've brought this up before at the Winter Flounder uh, Board, but I, I just want to continue to uh, reiterate that uh, on that particular species, I think somebody should do something to uh, make the target and the threshold a little more realistic. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Tom Foti. 
Yeah, I, mean, I especially think about weak fish because you know, that's the poster child where we did everything right. I mean, with cooperation with the South Atlantic Council, we got fish excluding devices put in on the shrimp fishery. We basically changed the whole way we we market weak fish. It was no longer the, the, the six inch fish going to like smelts. Every fish had to be at least sexually mature before it was harvested. And we, we cut down on the quotas and did a fabulous job. It had no results. It went the opposite direction after a period of time. It was not our fault. But as when you put an overfish and overfishing, people says, what, can, what are you doing about this? How are you going to bring them back? And I, I look at them, and you've got to call the man upstairs because we ain't getting the back by what we're doing. It has to be environmental conditions or, as the, the stock assessment said, the peer review stock assessment, natural causes. And maybe we need to put an asterisk. You know, weak fish could all of a sudden rebound when the environmental conditions are right. We've seen that over the period of time. And the other one is... Um, Croker. Croker was on its high, and now it's starting to go down as low. And what we, could we do to influence that, that rebuilding might not be there. And again, it'll be a fisheries if it goes down like it has in cycles. We're going to start declaring it overfish and have to rebuild it. And I don't know if we're going to do much about that. Adam? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think what I'm hearing is there's concerns from a number of people about a need to take a look at these performance definitions and how we relate them. I'm not sure how we best go about achieving that. Um, everybody's been able to key on a particular species as an example. I'll use Tautog as an example, which is listed as depleted, which says it reflects a low level of abundance, even though the SSB is at over 50 percent of the threshold. And I think if we looked at a glass of water that was over half full, we wouldn't necessarily call that glass depleted at that point. Um, it exhibits characteristics of stable, being consistent in recent years, viable on a slightly uptick of a trend. Uh, so there we have that species in one particular category, but yet it clearly could be put into a number of the others as well. And that's just an example of, I think, a need to revisit these performance definitions as they currently exist. With no other hands around the table, I'd, I'd like to summarize and make some comments. I was I was thinking that these comments might come up in the board deliberations, but they haven't. Um, so we we have we have struggled back and forth and worked on these definitions for a long time, um, and I was ready to shut down any wordsmithing um, discussions that ensued this morning or this today. Um, I think there are nuances and caveats with all the fisheries that we have, um, and and you know every one of them. The stock assessments are a couple. Of, you know the original stock assessments, the FMPs are hundreds of pages long that 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 address that. So there's no way that we can provide a single definition or a single stock status that really is going to be reflective of everything we do. I just don't think it's possible. Um, in North Carolina, our, our stock status definition, some of them are a page long, and they address a lot of the concerns that Walter brought up and I think some of the other folks around the table brought up. Um, the number idea is intriguing, but it I, I think there's some minor adjustments to this table that we can make um, that may address a lot of the concerns around the table. And so I would throw out for your consideration, I, I agree a lot with what um, uh, Doug said. And from my perspective, you can't be viable and rebuilding at the same time. That, that's, that's inconsistent with at least our definitions is that if you are, if by, by definition, you're either recovering and rebuilding or you are viable. So one of the things that I would suggest would be that we say rebuilt slash viable. Because if it's rebuilt, it's viable. And granted, those may vacillate up and down between the target and the threshold over time. And we don't really want to start saying, no, they're no longer viable because they're now not at the target. But then just, and then, and then just simply state rebuilding or rebuilding slash recovering, which is really the same thing, and then just simply um, indicate recovering, rebuilding stocks exhibit increasing trends, not stable, but increasing trends. And that, so all you would have to do is take that word stable out, and then you would end up with a continuum that I think makes more sense. 
or at least it does to me. So you're either viable and rebuilt, or you're recovering, or you're depleted concern, et cetera. And that way, I, I don't think we need to really get involved or in deep, too much more discussion about the, the actual definitions. Now, that, that's my view um, from the discussions around the table. And so I would open the floor again for comments on what I've suggested. Doug? Just to clarify, when you say we're, we're taking out uh, under rebuilding the uh, s stable word, so what if we have a, where would that stock be defined if you have a stock between the, the uh, threshold and, and the target that, has not, that is in the process of rebuilding but is, say, sta at a stable level for 10 years but still hasn't rebuilt? What, what well, the way we the way we've handled that is that it's still rebuilding. If it's not met, if it's oh, never it's met the target, then it's rebuilding. It'd still be rebuilding, yes. regardless of whether it's going up. I thought right. I mean, if it, as long as as long if if, if for example, um, there's vacillations in the year class strength of red drum that live to be 60 years. Um, you know, one of the questions we'll talk about today under the red drum TORs is when are we rebuilt in red drum? Is it after 60 years of healthy year classes are established or not? So they'll be re they could be under rebuilding status for years and years and years. Um, but if you're just sitting somewhere and you're below the target and you haven't been declared rebuilt or viable at some point, I mean, at some point this commission is going to designate something as rebuilt or recovered. So if it's never been rebuilt or re declared rebuilt or recovered, it would remain in that recovering mode recovering. until it met that definition. But you're going to take out those stable words. That would be my suggestion. Now, uh, that's for the board to decide. But I mean, I, I don't think if it's it could be stable at a low level, and that's not good. So then it would could be depleted. It, it stable would complicate the recovering definition at, at the, in the North Carolina definition, which is. In, inconsequential to this discussion, but it's just it's not consistent. Maybe I'm missing something here, but I thought if we're rebuilding, we're already above the threshold, right? So we've already we're not at rebuild. You're not stable at a low level. You're above the threshold, but below the target. And I thought you just had originally said that. The, the trend wouldn't make any difference if you're between the, if you're rebuilding, uh, whether it's stable or increasing. But then you're taking out the stable. Uh, I, I guess I'm missing, it sounds like a circular argument there. If you're above the threshold and just sitting there, are you recovering if you're not moving forward, if you're not increasing? You're not recovering, but you're in the rebuilding phase. Right. Okay. So we just have it as a rebuilding if it's stable. You, you could. I mean, I think that'll create some confusion, but it sounded like it already has by taking it out. So, I mean, it's a, I, mean I, I don't object to keeping it in there. That was just a suggestion. And the key is being over the threshold. Dave Simpson? Yeah, I think uh, my latest word that I have a problem with is viable. Um, Tony loves depleted, but I, I, I look at definitions online of viable, and it's basically it's capable of surviving. That's the gist of the definition. And if any of our stocks are not capable of surviving, then we're way beyond a fishery management problem. You're talking declaring failure on a, an Endangered Species Act action. So. I think it serves us no no purpose at all here because it's extremely misleading. Um, so I, I would get rid of it. I wouldn't use the term viable. I have to confess that was my word. So I, it's fine. It's not. I got, I got to take credit where credit is due and, f and blame where it's due. But I mean, we 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 ran into that same argument at home where we wanted to say healthy, and then we ended up with stocks that. Um, 
you know, because of other situations, they weren't necessarily healthy. And it would and it would come out that, for example, base gallops or something that could have contaminants in it were healthy, and that that created a problem in human health issues. So we we tried to come up with a word that we could use to define, and and we clearly define it as being a stock that is capable of 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 maintaining a sustainable harvest. That's the way we've defined viable. We didn't use the Webster's Dictionary. So, but, you know, if, if there's another word that somebody, I mean, you could say sustainable, um, or you, but rebuilt, you get back into the same concerns that Dave brought up, is that you may not ever be able to rebuild. And so some stocks, they may never be able to be considered rebuilt, whereas they might be able to be considered viable if they're able to continually produce. Yeah. So I think my problem was I looked at the Daniel Webster Dictionary and not the Lewis Daniel Dictionary. But, um, <laughs> See, that's but, your problem, man. Yeah. So, so you may be thinking in terms of a viable fishery, you know, that it's economically profitable, what I was reading is it's a viable population, and I, that's, that's very different. Lauren? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm reminded that uh, what we're discussing here today is probably going to go onto our website. It will go into documents and the like. And I was thinking about uh, the concerned citizen with a reasonable knowledge base, will that concerned citizen come to an accurate conclusion? Uh, hopefully so at the end of this discussion when they, when they uh, peruse our, uh, these terms, they'll, they'll actually come to a, the correct uh, and accurate conclusion. Uh, when I hear thing, words like uh, complicated or confusing, uh, then I lose hope on that. So let's, let's make sure it's clear. Thank you. So, are you comfortable with rebuilding, recovering, but keeping the stable word in? Does anybody object to that definition or that, that designation? Okay, so that's so we're good there. And you don't like viable. We have rebuilt. Do you want to just leave it as rebuilt? Or do you want to slash with that one too? And it could be sustainable, really nice, good, happy face, emoticons. <laughs> That's what we should use as emoticons, the crying one and everything. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, co I'm cool with whatever you guys want, but rebuilt's fine with me, just to leave it as rebuilt. Bob? I just want to put a vote in for sustainable. I think it's a word that people have become increasingly comfortable with, and I think it's uh, to communicate to the public, I like using sustainable in lieu of viable. Thank you. Any objection to rebuilt sustainable? Seeing there's a concern with rebuilt sustainable, Adam? Well, it's not so much a concern with that, Mr. Chairman, as it is. Are we really going to be able to come to explicit definitions here today in the time we have allotted or would we be better served by charting some course how to better address this? I think we've heard a lot of concerns and I think to Lauren's point these are terms that are going to be attached to the species we manage for public consumption and what we do with them and what people do with them as they come here and provide public comment and input on these. I think this is really very important as it reflects the job we're doing here, and I think it deserves the time that we need to put into it, however we best achieve that. Thank you, Adam. Bill Goldsboro? With respect to sustainable, to me, that's a word that we would only use to describe a harvest level, whether or not that removal rate is sustainable and not used to describe the status of a stock because just like with stable, it could be sustainable at a low level. In fact, the lowest levels are probably the most sustainable. Um, so maybe the thing to do is to use stable, but when we use it, always say stable but at a low level or stable but, you know, qualify a little bit. 
Yeah, and I, and I think if somebody thinks that they're going to read a sentence or two sentences that is going to adequately uh, characterize the status of a fishery, then they're 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 going to be disappointed. There's no way. Um, as we've heard around the table, there there's many difficulties and issues associated with Gulf of Gulf of Mexico I mean Gulf of Maine flounder or winter flounder or whatever the issue is weak fish you you, you can't do it I, I don't see that there's any way that this board sitting around this table is going to wordsmith and construct definitions above and beyond what we've already done um, and so where we are at this stage of the game is I think we've done this now twice or three times. We've come back with these definitions. And so if we're not happy with these definitions, we need to, but we, I guess we need to start over um, and, and, and try to come up with it, do it again. Um, I just don't know that we'll ever have a suite of definitions that adequately address every single concern about every single fishery we have. So really it's up to the board to decide do you want to retain these definitions and move forward with these definitions as presented here today or do you want to reboot and continue maybe set up a subgroup of the board to work to put together something because staff has done as much, I think, as they can do to bring us something that, that is, you know, generic enough that it, it incorporates all the different issues. Doug? So I think the problem we'll have is, um, uh, you're right, is a problem that cannot be solved. Uh, more specifically, when people look at a word, they're going to make their own definition. I think the important thing for the commission is to have a table with how we define it. So when people come and say, okay, rebuilt, what does that mean? This is what it means to the commission. I think the staff has done a good job. I think we've got a minor, a couple minor tweaks that we were talking about here um, of coming up with some very uh, simple definitions that will meet uh, what our, hopefully our de definition is, at least it, I, I'm comfortable with it the way it is. I don't know if the rest of the commission is with this, but I, I, I think we're at that point right now where uh, we're as good as we're going to be able to get. Richie? Pass. I don't, uh, Adam? I would speak in favor of further refinement, Mr. Chairman. I, and I think you know at least from our from our experience we've we've done that if we if we, it were they're not going to be etched in granite on the front door so i mean we we will be able to make modifications if we find you know if we start to get question about you know a certain definition and and we recognize that but I mean that's hard for me to project what we're going to see i mean I've got one very clear order to refine and either silence or comfort with the where we are right now. So I don't, Robert, you have a lot of consternation on your face. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, we started this several years ago um, with the idea that um, at one point we had a date on these things. And, and we were going to hold ourselves accountable. Excuse me, our predecessors um, decided that we were going to be accountable and by 2015 we were going to rebuild or we we're going to make satisfactory progress. I think, the, um, I think the issue we have here is one of accountability. I think it's, it's you know, are we doing what we are here, what we come here quarterly, what we employ a staff, and what we go home to, uh, to try to accomplish. And, um, and I think we all recognize the challenges that, that are not associated with controlling F. Um, but I think at the end of the day, I think we bring, um, we put ourselves in a perilous position if we, if we tweak definitions. And again, this is good conversation, um, but I think I go back to where we were. This was an effort to where are we going to be in 2015? 
you know, what's our report card? What are our shareholders um, going to have to say about the job we're doing? And I just encourage us to think about that as we as we contemplate where we go from here. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. Richie. Richie? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was just asking Bob, a number of years ago we, had, we used colors, and um, I support living with these definitions, but then uh, adding colors that are more general, and that would be for the public. You know, so you got green, yellow, and red. Um, you know, the, we, uh, we can understand these for the most part, and, it, and if we lump this in general into the colors, the, the public will certainly understand the colors. So that I, I have no objection to that, and I think that might get to some, one of Lauren's comments. I think it does. He's nodding in affirmative. So are we good with this, David? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I hope that we will be cautious in terms of the definitions we use for a couple of reasons. Um, first, if you look at the long historical record um, into which we entered, there has been baseline creep um, in terms of what these stocks may have been decades ago. Uh, we have to be realistic and deal with the situation that we face in terms of what's practical on these stocks. I would hope we'd be too, quite cautious, though, in determining that something is viable when it's at a very a relatively low level historically. Um, and in terms of the 2015 aspirations, of course there are aspirations, but I, I think it's our job as a commission to hold ourselves, um, again, within practical means to understanding the task before us is to do what we can to increase these these stocks and make them truly sustainable. I also feel as we're moving more towards ecosystem-based management that we're going to be understanding that some of these low low stocks and thresholds um, might appropriately be, be higher. And I think we've already seen arguments about that in the last, last couple of years. So um, I'm happy to go forward with this, but I, I do think we need to have some under, understanding that um, I think the public might look at those those viability ones and say, well, why are they calling that viability or potentially patting themselves on the back when we know that these are very low levels? Thank you. No, thank you. Good comments. What I have is what I have is from the discussion around the table is the the categories would would the two categories that would change would be rebuilt would become rebuilt sustainable. The viable word goes away. And the viable rebuilding definition would be recovering rebuilding. And then with the definitions um, as they are in the table right now with colors in the red, green, and yellow to designate to the public what we deem is good versus what they may perceive as good or bad is with the, with the one exception that I've heard from is everyone in agreement with that approach. Seeing no objection, that is the way we will proceed. So thank you for a very good discussion. And we have a lot of those on tap for today because I do want to tell you before I move on to the next agenda item that, again, we had a very good spirited discussion at our executive committee meeting this morning. And we will have the business meeting will be a very important meeting for everyone to attend. I know a lot of times folks say, well, we don't have any, anybody to find out of compliance. So <laughs> we'll skip that. Please do not skip the business meeting today. It occurs right after lunch. But there are very important discussions and very important information coming from the executive committee that needs to, be got, that needs to go out to the full commission for discussion and comment as well. So. Before anybody decides to leave early from this meeting, I just want to make sure you all got that. All right, so next item on the agenda is a review and consider comments on no fishery special management zones proposed rule. So Dave, this is your issue, so I know you are keyed up, so if you would like to let's yeah let, Dave let us go through the let us go through the presentation first and then I know you are you're you're lined up to speak after or, or ask questions after Tony has given her presentation thank you mr. chairman um, uh, 
NOAA Fisheries has a proposed rule on special management zones off the coast of Delaware for five, five artificial reef sites. Uh, they extended the public comment period and comment can be submitted until August 19th. I'm going to present information on these um, artificial reef sites and uh, trying to get feedback from the policy board on whether or not we want the commission wants to submit comment on the proposed rule and if so, what do those comments want to be? Um, these um, uh, artificial reef sites are proposed in the federal waters off the coast of Delaware for um, artificial reefs that have been sponsored by the Sport Fish Restoration Project funds and in um, maintaining those funding um, for the building and the maintenance of these sites uh, there is need to have only recreational fishing being used in those areas. Um, having commercial fishing in those areas um, goes against the um, rules of the original funding for the program. Uh, it proposes to only allow hook and line and spear fishing in the areas um, Part of the rationale is to limit the gear, gear conflicts on the reefs. They range in distance from 4 to 58 nautical miles offshore. They are rectangular in shape and are proposed to have a, four point, a point four six kilometer or 500 yard buffer zone around each of the areas that range from 7.42 to 8.81 square kilometers. And in your briefing materials, there is a chart showing where those reefs are. It was a PDF, and I could not transfer that over into a picture, so I apologize. Um, some of the impacts that are listed in the proposed rule, um, it's information that comes from the vessel trip reports um, with... Uh, that are shown within 0.46 kilometers of the reefs. They're in Site 13. Um, there are greater than 10 commercial fishing trips from 2008 to 2010. In Site 14, there's greater than 20 trips in 2009. And at Site 11, there's 7 to 25 trips from 2004 to 2006. But that number drops in the more recent years, 2008 to 2010, to 3 to 8 trips. Um, site 11 and 13 are dominated by pot and trap gear and site 14 was dominated by the trawl and dredge gear. Um, so the gross income impacts on the percent of total average of gross income for those vessels that are fishing in these areas um, you can see that less than 5% of these vessels that are fishing in this area for the small shellfish um, is six businesses. For large shellfish business, it's only one. And small fin fish, it's three. From 5 to 9% of their income coming from these reef sites, um, it's very few, only one in the small shellfish and one in the small fin fish, as well as the 10 to 19 percent. And there's only one entity that has 20 to 29 percent of its revenue coming from these areas, and it's a small fin fish um, entity. Um, additional impacts, um, you would have increased availability of fish to the hook and line and spear fishing if you no longer have um, commercial fishing in those areas. Um, the commercial fishing effort would shift to other areas. For the fixed gear, these shifts may result in increased gear conflicts because they're um, forced to move into areas with mobile gears, and that also could potentially lead to um, increased gear damage or loss. Um, but it's difficult to determine the full impacts since you don't know exactly how people would move. And then as well as if they do move to other sites, those sites could be less productive depending on where they move to. Um, 
The New England Fishery Management Council submitted comments to NOAA that were on the supplemental materials. So review them. And then, Terry, if you have anything addition that I left out, please let me know. Um, their comments are mostly pertaining to Area 14, um, which overlaps with scallop skate and monkfish fishing grounds. And it's with that area is within the elephant trunk scallop rotation area. Um, that area has been open since 2004 and is proven to be very valuable and productive fishery. The council found that the analysis that was conducted for the EA was incomplete. There were no impacts on the monk and skate fish and the skate fisheries, and no overlays of the management zones and the SMZs were conducted. Uh, the council found that if the, the center could survey conveys area 14 overlaps and it shows very high concentrations of offshore scallop beds with site 14. Um, VTRs are likely an underestimate of impacts but no attempt was made to correct such an action. For example, you could use VMS to do these impacts and the EA also does not account for any of the interannual variation of the fishery due to the rotational aspect of that scallop um, management area. Um, and so they're recommending that the that NOAA goes back and redoes the analysis for that. Um, and also to note, there's currently no artificial reef within Area 14, so it is open fishing ground right now. And closing the area would be in that um, actually closing an active fishing ground. And the council predicts that depending on the timing of the fishery, you could have a loss between one and twenty million dollars since it is a rotational fishery. Um, and then there was also comments submitted by Delaware and Delaware had say, uh, su suggested that um, they also have these SMZs within their state waters and they do not have buffer zones around their reefs in Delaware and um, their Fish and Wildlife Enforcement agents don't consider this to be a problem to not have buffer zones so they're recommending to have no buffer zones. And then Delaware only includes featureless bottom sites, but in most cases, um, natural wrecks were adjacent to sites within the proposed buffer zone. So these are traditional areas for commercial pop fishermen, and they don't believe that those areas should be lost. Um, and then they also noted that the precedent for a proposed buffer may have been established by the South Atlantic Council within their snapper grouper fisheries, and they've been in effect for over 20 years. Um, and at that time, the Lorian was the best navigational aid, but today, since we have GPS, it's um, easier for vessels to identify and pinpoint their locations so that you wouldn't need that 500-yard buffer zone. Um, so again, I'm looking to see if we should, the commission should submit comments on the rule, and if so, what are the issues that we would want to address? Thank you, Tony. Questions for Tony Galen? Thank you. Um, just one clarification. Um, the, the federal rule does not prohibit commercial fishing per se. Uh, it, it's a gear restriction, so commercial fishing with hook and line gear would still be allowed in, in the areas under the rule. But scalloping would not. With mobile gear. If you could catch them with hook and line, I guess. If it was legal, you could. <laughs> Can you do that? No, no, can't do that. Terry? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Tony, for a good summary of the Council's letter. Uh, I would, just to follow up on the last comment, uh, the, the New England Council did ask for, uh, if this was to move forward, to consider exempting mobile bottom tending gear from Area 14. Uh, in your supplemental uh, materials, there's a copy of a letter I wrote last week, and there are three pages of graphs that, um, that depict the area in exploitable biomass. Thank you, Terry. Bill Adler? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in, in the statistics, uh, Tony, that you came out with, like a uh, percentage of, of uh, uh, 
uh, income and percentages of stuff. We, we were, we've run into this uh, in, in a dif different issue, the whale issue, and uh, trying to say, well, the, you know, nobody fishes here, or very few fishes here, it's not a big deal. And, and as we've always found out in that issue, uh, had to do with, yes, there's not too many, but for the few that do, it's a very important area for them. And I don't know whether the statistics just throw everything together like they did in our thing. It's, all, it's a very small percentage of income. It's a very small percentage of fishermen. It's a very small... Yeah, it probably was, but it was very important to those few that were there. And I'm not sure uh, the way the statistics are gathered, they go, well, a very small amount of money was earned. Yeah, maybe it was a lot for one guy and not a lot in the overall picture. And I, I wanted to ask Russell if I could... Um, have you heard any um, thing from the fishermen in that area about this issue? And that's where I'll stop. Thank you. Address that, Russell. To be honest with you, that's handled by the the coastal uh, groups, and mostly what I look at is the Chesapeake Bay area. So I haven't had any input from the coastal groups on this. Tom McConnell? Yes, we, we've shared this uh, proposal with our coastal fishermen and have not heard any objections to this point. Yes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've had a chance to dive several of those sites off of uh, Delaware myself, and I've seen a number of the fish pots. The ones that are in the periphery of the of the material that's put down, whether it's subway cars or whatever that material is, concrete. Yeah, everything seems to work out well. And the interactions I've had with the recreational fishermen, the charter boat fishermen, the party boat fishermen, it seems like they coexist fine. The issues seem to um, manifest themselves when the gear is wrapped up in the material. I've come upon come upon a couple of pots while I was diving where they were entangled in the material and I've actually released over a dozen and a half tautog and sea bass that are trapped uh, in the pots but I guess my question for Tony or the Delaware folks is what is the exact nature of the conflict is it that um, the fishermen are encountering numerous uh, buoy gear that are in the vicinity and they just can't fish the uh, those locations is it does appear that as long as the fish pots are in the periphery, everybody seems to coexist um, in harmony. Yeah, Dave, can you address Marty's question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the primary conflicts are in addition to the funding restriction issue with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and sport fish restoration, is our recreational fishermen are encountering conflicts with the commercial uh, pots. So the recreational fishermen um, are entangling in those and it is a direct gear conflict. So hopefully that answers the question. Now a couple other points I want to um, reiterate. The statistics really don't fully capture uh, the impact. I think uh, Bill brought up the issue before. Uh, fully capture the impact on a few select commercial fishermen that fish the area. Um, there are significant economic impacts to a couple of our fishermen. Our Tidal Fin Fish Advisory Council in the state has uh, supports the concept of the of the SMMZ, but does not support the 500 foot um, buffers, uh, 500 yard buffers. I'm sorry, and the Division of Fish and Wildlife also uh, did not ask for that 500 yard buffer and intend to submit comments uh, requesting those be removed. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, and earlier reference was made to the South Land Council. I'd just like to uh, um, maybe ask a question just for clarification uh, and then also um, comment about our situation uh, with our reefs. Um, in the South Atlantic, I believe it's a gear restriction is also a uh, – the restrictions on possession are limited to the personal possession. So it's an effect – I guess it has the effect of being a recreational bag limit, possession limit on the SMZs off of South Carolina at least. Um, and is that, the, I guess the question for uh, NOAA Fisheries in Delaware, is that's what's contemplated here?
Paul Perra with Noah Fisheries. No. Uh, the possession limit is whatever it is, recreational, commercial, depending on how you're fishing. Um, the restriction is just for the gear. Adam? Does Delaware have any response to the concerns about Reef Site 14 or a suggested way forward? Yes, ask that again? Does Delaware have a suggested way forward or a response to the concerns about Reef Site 14? Yes, thank you. Um, Reef Site 14, when that was originally permitted, the area was closed, and we have no concerns with removal of that. In fact, we'll be submitting comments that um, to uh, support removal of 14 from the SMZ. Thank you. Does that address most of the concerns that have been discussed, Walter? But yeah, I was, Terry was just showing me his, his scallop chart, and it, and it seems a little odd that you would put uh, something like that in a productive area. I, I thought typically artificial reefs go places where the, that aren't very productive to make them productive, and this is already a productive scallop bed, so it seemed a little odd. Dave? I yeah, just want to reinforce that when it was permitted, it was a closed fishery at the time. Um, so uh, currently, you know, we um, <clears throat> excuse me don't see the justification for keeping 14 as a um, SMZ. I know when we discussed the South Carolina SMZs at the South Atlantic Council years ago, um, one of the big concerns, and y'all may have dealt with this in Delaware, was the funding sources of those reefs, um, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Robert, that um, South Carolina funded all their reef material with Wallet Borough funds that were recreational dollars. So that was one of the big issues. Um, so let me go to Robert. You've got your hand up, and then Mark. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll answer it in the form of a question, like it would be Jeopardy, if I may. Um, the question, uh, yes, that is in fact um, the case in off of South Carolina. There are a number of, of areas that are known as artificial reefs that were not constructed reefs. These are old shipwrecks, and I guess that's my question to, uh, to Delaware. These are all constructed um, with federal aid dollars, as the case was with the South Carolina SMZs. Dave, is that correct? Yeah, Robert, that is correct, yes. Using federal uh, wallet pro funds. Follow up. Uh, just to follow up, I think this is a very reasonable request. I think, um, given where we were in South Carolina, um, our community came to us. Uh, again, I think it's important to note that this is not an exclusion of, of commercial fishermen, um, but it's a gear restriction. So I think that satisfied at the time NOAA Fisheries, and and I support you know, the request. All right, with that, I'd like to, I know Dave Frule has been, uh, would like to address the board. So Dave, if you'd like to come up to the mic again, state your name and who you represent, and we'll take your comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is David Frula, F-R-U-L-L-A, and we represent the Fisheries Survival Fund, the Limited Access Scallop Fleet. Um, I, I really should probably quit while we're ahead, uh, <laughs> which is a good admonition, and we really appreciate Delaware's um, offer to take uh, Site 14 off. Um, if I may, just for a minute, give you a little bit. For those of you in New England, you know this pretty well. Many of you from the mid know this. But I just want to make sure that folks understand what we talk about when we're talking about rotational scallop management. Um, there's two elements to the scallop fishery in New England for the limited access fleet. One are days at sea, that you get a certain number of days at sea. And the other are these trips into access areas where access areas are uh, they're trip limited. Uh, the fleet gets a certain number of trips per year. These areas rotate and they're closed, almost like rotational farming, based on when scallops set there. There are certain, 
there are areas in New England that are a bit different because of the George's Bank closed areas, and those areas are, are, are drawn and permanent and are drawn without regard really to scallop abundance. There are three areas in the Mid-Atlantic, the Hudson Canyon, the Elephant Trunk, and Delmarva going north to south. Those areas were drawn and are used because those are historic areas of scallop settlement. The Elephant Trunk is in the middle and it's the one we're concerned about. Um, that has seen in the 16 years I've been doing scallop management, the largest set of scallops we've ever seen. Um, there's one that may be a little bigger off southern Georgia's um, that is coming along now. There's a very, very, very good set in the elephant trunk right now as well that, that are coming along and we expect to open in a year or two. Um, so you wouldn't see with these areas fishing every year. You'd see it periodically, which is what you see in the tables. Um, so that, that shouldn't come as a surprise. One thing I think I would note, though, to Mr. Adler's comment through the chair is that this may not be an issue here of a handful of fishermen being especially dependent on this area, not from the scallop fleet, but it's the fleet. But when you use, if I'm understanding it correctly, when you use the VTR data, you only report VTR information once when you're fishing in a statistical area. So that means there's the random chance that you happen to report when you were on that site, which is presently open to fishing. So you got a little bit different dynamic working here. Um, the other point I'd note is that just in terms of the, the haul length information and the number of hauls per trip that are reported, um, you tend to get a different, again, a different set of considerations in scallop fishing when you're in an access area because these are areas of high, high abundance and high grow out. So you're going to take shorter hauls and fewer trips. Um, so thank you. Again, I just appreciate, I don't want to belabor this, I hope you do decide to recommend taking Area 14 out, and thanks for the opportunity to address you. Thank you, Dave. What I hear around the table is an interest in perhaps sending a letter um, supporting the Delaware request for the SMZs with the exemption of Area 14. Or buffers. Is everybody comfortable with that? Dave? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we would also like to extend and appreciate if the Atlantic states would um, also uh, comment in support of removing the proposed 500-yard buffers. Yes, and removing the 500-yard buffers. Thank you. Bill? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm with you on that. Uh, removing the 500-yard buffer from just 14 or the other areas? Um, all the areas, and then 14 would be a moot point if indeed it was eliminated from an SMZ. Thank you. Yeah, I think that everybody kind of gets what they want here. Paul, welcome. We propose the, the measures exactly as recommended through the Mid-Atlantic Council. Uh, and the Mid-Atlantic Council got input from enforcement, and that's the reason they put in the buffer. Uh, there were a uh, debate about a thousand yard buffer. No buffer was a compromise. Uh, the mid just uh, for your information, Mid Atlantic Council is going to meet next week here in Washington, and they have this item on the agenda. Um, so, uh, without input from enforcement, I'd be kind of concerned about uh, how the commission would uh, comment on the buffer. Yeah, Delaware's enforcement, from our understanding, Delaware's enforcement indicated it was not an issue. Is that correct, Dave? And he, yes, go ahead. An additional follow-up. I want to point out around most of these sites, um, there are existing wrecks that um, are natural wrecks for which there are really no conflicts. And then that 500-yard buffer would preclude uh, our sea bass fishermen specifically uh, potting on those wrecks that are outside the SMZ of, of the wreck. Um, the reef that we establish. So these naturally occurring wrecks uh, would be unduly impacted if there was the 500 yard, and we feel that's unfair to our commercial fishermen. Brandon? 
Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just two points from New Jersey's um, standpoint. One, regarding the Wallet Bro funds, New, New Jersey did lose its federal aid um, funding specifically to build artificial reefs because of these conflicts. So it's been two years since New Jersey has had these funds available. So it is a real uh, issue that is that is there. And two, just to inform inform the board that the, the, the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife will be submitting comments as as it's, as a state agency in support of the proposed measures as well. Supporting Area 14 be included or not? Well, that hadn't been discussed. We can mo The letter hasn't gone out yet, so we can modify that letter to include it. Um, we would support that, so. Yeah, I think for our mid partners on the commission, you know, getting, getting your agreement with this is probably, would probably be helpful, for sure. Can't control that, but we're also a lot bigger than the Mid-Atlantic Council, so we can take them if we have to. <laughs> Um, so, the southern boys will come in fighting. <laughs> Anything else on the SMZ request? If there's no objection to the letter, then we will draft a letter for probably for Bob's signature. Um, doing exactly what we all agreed to, and I'll refresh one more time that we will support Delaware's request for SMZs with the caveats to remove Area 14 and to remove the 500-yard buffer requirements. That is the position of the Commission on that issue. All good? All right, move on. Next on the agenda is the stock assessment updates. We'll have a tag team over here, so at your leisure, ladies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to update you on the status of the Atlantic Menhaden assessment. I'm pleased to report that we are still on schedule for peer review in December through our host down at CDAR. Uh, we've held, in, in preparation for this assessment, 12 meetings. Those include nine webinars and five in-person meetings, including our first assessment workshop, which was held in June. Um, we did not complete all of our tasks at that workshop, and we felt we needed one more to finish things up, and so we'll be holding that next week, actually actually down in Beaufort once more. Um, but I'd like to briefly review the items that we did manage to uh, complete at the June assessment workshop. Uh, we did review and finalize all input data sources and decisions regarding those data sources. Uh, we reviewed all parameter and model configuration options. We identified the base and uh, sensitivity list, long list of sensitivity model runs that we'll be completing. Uh, we also reviewed th the uh, progress on the historical tagging data analyses that have been going on. Uh, we also began initial discussions on biological reference points, and we'll be uh, revisiting that topic extensively next week again. Uh, we provided feedback on development of the assessment models, so some preliminary models had been built, but we changed the configuration so much that they needed to be rerun. So we will be reviewing the results of those next week. Uh, and then we also were provided with a stakeholder analysis of the potential effects on Menhaden migration on our estimation of fishery selectivity patterns, and we did uh, review that and consider it um, as information for the assessment. Uh, I also wanted to update you briefly on the Ecological Reference Point Working Group's progress. The uh, group held two conference calls uh, since I last updated you, and we met in June at, during TC Meeting Week to finalize our work on the TOR number seven for the Atlantic Menhaden assessment. And that was to, um, just to remind you, is to identify potential ERPs that could account for Menhaden's role as a forage fish, and to provide the peer reviewers with an idea of where we think we might be going with that methodology and what we think might be the, the appropriate uh, approach, and then get some constructive feedback from them on, on those ideas. Uh, at present, we have identified multiple ecological reference points as candidates and several different tools or models that we might use to calculate those reference points, uh, and those are all still under consideration um, and will undergo further vetting as we proceed this fall. Uh, we hope to review all of that, uh, at least preliminary results from most of our models uh, at our September TC Meeting Week uh, 
meeting, and in, those will be included in the Atlantic Manhattan Assessment Report to address TOR number seven. So the Atlantic, just because of the way our process works, the Atlantic Manhattan TC will then review the entire report, including the ERP plan, and that will be at a meeting in November before it goes to peer review. And then obviously the peer review panel will hopefully, hopefully provide some constructive feedback on our ideas. So just to recap the whole timeline, I know some of you are interested in the exact dates. Uh, th throughout the rest of the year, we will again next week have our August 12th to 15th assessment workshop again in Beaufort. In September, during TC Meeting Week, the ERP working group will be meeting again to finalize our ERP plan. We'll have numerous other phone calls to cross the T's and dot the I's, I'm sure. And then November 5th to 6th, the TC will do the final vetting and approval of the report for peer review and the peer review will be December 9th to, two, 9th to 11th in Atlantic Beach, North Carolina. Um, and then we hope to have the finalized assessment and peer review report to you at the February meeting in 2015. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Bill? Just assumed. <laughs> sorry. I figured, I figured, I mean, sorry. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Actually, I, I uh, will take the opportunity to ask Jenny, um, just because I'm curious, were any uh, alternative models or modeling approaches submitted for consideration? For the meeting next week you're speaking about, or the first meeting? Yeah. So next week, yes. Uh, uh, Doug Butterworth and uh, Rebecca Radmeyer have submitted uh, through Omega Protein as consultants for Omega Protein have uh, submitted an alternative model and uh, some conclusions based on those models that uh, they submitted it a month ago in preparation for this meeting and we've had a chance to vet it and review it and we'll be he'll be presenting at the meeting and then we'll be discussing its merits um, and at that meeting. I figured you had interest there, Bill. That was with all due respect. Anybody else questions on Menhaden for All right. Next is my favorite. No, next I like togs too, but I did not did not say I didn't like tall togs. Don't send me a mug. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was sturgeon next, so tall togs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't actually have any slides for this because this is going to be a very short update. Um, the After our assessment meeting uh, this summer, the Tatog TC sort of took a step back to reconsider some of our regional um, definitions within the assessment and had we decided to completely redo those that would have delayed us more but we've decided to go with the ones that we did most of the analyses on and as a result we're planning to go to peer review um, sometime in October or November. As a result we won't have the the final assessment and peer review report ready for the October board meeting but we will have that done for you in time for February. So um, I will take any questions on that. Totogs. Adam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Will there be both a coastal and a regional analysis of EPA going to peer review or only one or the other? Uh, there will be both. So there will be a, um, a coast-wide modeling approach, which is sort of... Uh, the continuity run, if you will, to compare to the previous results, and then we will also be doing separate assessments on a regional basis. Dave? Thank you. Can, can you remind me what the regions are that you'll be doing? And, you know, you've got a, right now we have a Mass Rhode Island assessment, and how does that fit into the regions? So the regions will be um, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut as a single region, New York and New Jersey as a single region, and then Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia as a single region. Follow up to that, Dave? Yeah, I just have to um, say it'll be interesting to see how we figure out how to split Long Island Sound in two and, and those two and those two highly overlapping fisheries. So um, I don't know if there's something we can do to sort of anticipate the logical disconnect if the rules are even more different in the future than they are now between our two states' waters. Adam, did you have something? Uh, 
Yeah, it was to that point, Mr. Chairman. I was just wondering if you could provide any insight to the board about how that region is working with, are you just splitting a line down the middle of Long Island Sound, or how, how, how is that contributing to the regions? I would have to ask Katie to answer that, or somebody with staff. I would have absolutely no idea. Are you, do you mean from a from a management perspective or from a science and data perspective? Uh, from a science and data perspective, and then how you would expect us to filter that into the management process? I mean, that's a good question. It's something the um, the technical committee struggled with as well. Of do we lump Connecticut with New York and New Jersey, or do we put Connecticut with Massachusetts and Rhode Island? And I think we went with Mass the putting them with Massachusetts and Rhode Island on the basis of the available indices and the trends that we're seeing, as well as some of the biological information that, in terms of growth rates, they appear to be more similar to the Massachusetts and Rhode Island uh, stocks than to the New New York and New Jersey stocks. But we recognize that. Obviously, there are removals from the Long Island Sound system that may not be getting perfectly accounted for with the data that we have. Um, in terms of going forward with management, I think that's that's a question for you guys of are you comfortable with having separate regulations for, for it within Long Island Sound? And if you're not, how can you make those line up with what the stock needs to be, where the stock needs to be at? I don't think we're anticipating... There, obviously, I can't speak to the final results, but I don't think we're anticipating a situation where one stock is overfished and needs immediate reaction, and the other stock is perfectly fine and needs no react, no inter intervention. So I think there's room to compromise in terms of the types of regulations that will be needed within Long Island Sound, so that you can get a consistent management program in this area. Yeah, and that's enough on that. Just because this is just an update on the delay in the stock assessment, we're not going to get into a discussion or debate on the assessment or any of the things like that. Nope. Nope. Now, go ahead with the surgeon. Um, so I do have a presentation for this. So for the Atlantic Sturgeon assessment, um, basically current progress so far, we had a data workshop in the fall of 2013 where we brought all of our uh, technical committee members as well as some outside expertise together to sort of review the available data sets and try to figure out where we're going to go from here. After that, um, we formed subcommittees of the stock assessment subcommittee to focus on genetic information, tagging, and bycatch that will all contribute, we hope, to the overall assessment. Um, these have met via conference call and webinar since then, and we have tentatively scheduled an assessment workshop for the fall of 2014. Um, however, through the data gathering process, the Stock Assessment Subcommittee has identified a number of ongoing projects that you're actually getting a list of now that have been funded either through um, Section 6 funding that with a start date of 2010, that, it, that the completion date was 2013. A lot of them got no-cost extensions through 2014. So these are um, information on, uh, these are acoustic tagging programs, genetic data inf um, to give us information on movement, movement spawn life history, mortality rates, but the problem is they are all ongoing now. And so it's been difficult to get the data because both because the PIs are reluctant to hand out data that is incomplete in the, where the project is not finished yet, um, as well as being reluctant to hand out data that may be used to um, that may undercut their future publishing um, opportunities. So as a result, the, the stock assessment has needs, we need additional input from the board because we have identified basically two timelines that the assessment can proceed on. And the major difference between them is sort of the, our ability to get down to a stock or a system or a DPS level assessment for a lot of these um, data sets. The data from these projects will greatly enhance our ability to assess Atlantic sturgeon on a stock or on a DPS level. And unfortunately, waiting for those data to become available, though, will probably delay completion of the stock assessment until 2017. So um, we put together as part of the memo sort of a timeline of what kind of analyses we're looking at and what level that we can complete them at. 
So this was part of the memo that went out in supplemental materials. And basically the point is on the coast-wide level, there's a number of things that we can do in 20, to be completed and reviewed in 2015 that you know, we would get to as well in 2017. And those would include things like trend analysis where we're looking at relative changes in abundance, um, tagging models to give us estimates of mortality within the system, within the, across the coast. <laughs> Data poor models to look at um, historical stock size and potential productivity of the stock. Um, SPR reference points to give us something to measure against. And um, historical proxy reference points, again, to give us something to measure against. So these can be completed on the coast-wide level in 2015. Waiting until 2017 would allow us to get better information or newer information to a lot of these analyses, but, but more importantly would allow us to go down to a finer scale to assess this species on. So that if we, a lot of the trend analysis we may not necessarily be able to do on a stock or a DPS level. Um, and definitely the tagging model we could not complete at a stock or DPS level to give us estimates of total mortality. Um, the data poor models we can't do on a stock or DPS level at this point. Um, we could do SPR reference points for some systems, but again, without a measure of mortality to compare it against, they're not very useful. And similarly with the index reference points, unless you have something to compare it against, they're not very useful. Whereas if we uh, wait for some of this uh, new information that will hopefully become available in over the next year or so, we will be able to get down to a finer scale for this population, a more appropriate modeling level for this population, whether that's stock or DPS or river system. Um, so what we're looking for from the board is basically input on the timeline that you prefer based on your management, management needs and objectives so that we can start to prioritize the work that we're doing and create an assessment timeline uh, to fit that schedule. Thank you. Very good summary. Um, let me just add to Katie's um, report one little caveat. Um, that, and I appreciate very much um, Angela Soma being here um, with the Protected Species Group. Um, if you'll recall whatever it was two years ago when the stock was declared an endangered species in most jurisdictions and threatened in the Bay of Maine, I believe it was, <clears throat> we were encouraged to move forward with an incidental take permit. We all were. And I don't know what progress has been made, um, particularly in those states north of North Carolina where they have um, gillnet fisheries that are known to interact with Atlantic sturgeon. Um, but the issue that we face um, is that we, in North Carolina, we have an incidental take permit. Now. We got it couple of weeks ago, signed, sealed, and delivered. So I'm, I'm implementing an incidental take permit right now. I don't know if any other states are doing that yet or not, and how close any of the other states are with their incidental take permits. Um, but for those of us that have one, or are in almost ready to have one and will begin implementing them, I'm facing the risk of having to close my fishery down if I catch a certain number of certain. Nobody else does because they haven't, they didn't move fast enough or they haven't worked hard enough or whatever the issue might be. They don't have an incidental take permit. So the, the one, at least as far as I know, Georgia and North Carolina are the only two states that have um, incidental take permits on sturgeon. So because of that, we may be extremely disadvantaged by having that permit. Um, so that raised, that, 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 increases the importance from having a stock assessment done as quickly as we possibly can in order to try to get some sense on what the status of the stock is. We've had discussion at the board level as to the concerns, at least that I have expressed, about using a stock assessment and some SPR value to determine whether or not a stock is endangered or not. That is a precedent that could, could be very dangerous especially for something like winter flounder or a stock that's at a very low SPR rate, um, that could create some real issues for us. So, but what I'm hearing now is that in order to have a good and concise stock assessment, that we're going to be three years off from even being able to have 
a new stock a stock assessment even done on Atlantic sturgeon. And if you look at the memo that was just passed around, there's almost $10 million, if not more than $10 million, being spent now to collect this information. It would have behooved us to have that information before the listing occurred. And I think there should be nods and agreement all around the table about that. Um, but they're not. They're endangered species. And so we run some real serious risks on um, being able to handle lawsuits that may come down on us. So I think I'm not trying to sway your decision in any way, shape, or form, but I think that's an important component for those of you with inshore gillnet fisheries that interact with sturgeon to keep in mind as you discuss or deliberate on whether or not to, because we've got to provide today, we've got to provide guidance to staff. Do we want the quick and dirty right out of the gate and do the, do the more comprehensive one and later? I mean, I think with the importance that this could have and with the expense that the states are going to have to go through to develop these ITPs and implement them, it might behoove us to do both and take that, you know, and modify our, 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 our schedules accordingly. But again, that will be up to the ISFMP policy board as to what to do. So I just felt like that was important information for you to have. I'm sorry if I was proselytizing from the chair on the state of North Carolina, but I'm only aware of North Carolina having have the ITP that's active and is going to be dealt with every day. So first I had Dave Borden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I was going to ask a question that you actually led into is why can't we do both? In other words, if we do both, uh, I, I would envision we, we get the results of the first phase and we're all, I mean, the staff, I think, has done an excellent job of articulating that it's not going to be as fine a resolution as we need to manage based on the DPS, but we could take some action, uh, a general action, uh, to uh, help protect the stock and then move on with a more detailed analysis, and which will put us in the position where we can actually manage down to the DPS level, which is what we need to do. So could we have a discussion about what's the uh, pros and cons of doing both? If I, if I could ask uh, either Katie or Bob to address the potential issues and how that might impact our stock assessment plans to do both. I think our concern with doing both is that it's a tremendous amount of work. So what you're talking about is dedicating a huge technical committee to five years of work for, for the foreseeable future. And right now we're struggling to get work done with people's current workloads. So what you want us to do, if, if you want us to do it that way, is to do a fast, rushed assessment to get at this broad coast-wide level, which will then be immediately probably questionable due to the new available data that's going to relate to the coastwide population and then immediately send that staff back to work to redo a lot of these analyses and do them on a finer scale. So I'm not saying that it's impossible, but what I'm saying is it's a tremendous amount of work from all of your technical committee members and we've already struggled to get work to get data done with people's current workloads. So to commit that much time and staff energy I think would be a con to the approach of doing them both. Obviously there are other, you know, you guys have your own concerns from a management perspective on this, but that in my mind would be the biggest con is that you would do something that would then later become out of date due to the availability of new data as well as having committed a tremendous amount of technical committee resources to something that becomes out of date and then requires additional work on their behalf to be done in 2017. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I hear your and attend to your concerns that you've mentioned um, about your particular situation in your state, but I did want to uh, hope the Commission will look very carefully at what we heard from the Technical Committee about this, and I think there are a couple of important points here. One is I think we need that tagging information, because that is really what is going to help us make decisions as to what is causing uh, mortality. Secondly, I think the historical information is particularly important, given the 
longevity of this species and the un uncertainties about what we're really looking at. I would recommend to uh, people who want to really look at the, the best long-term study that's been done of sturgeon is in Jeff Bolster's book, The Mortal Sea, the chapter on sturgeon. It goes back several centuries and up to recent, recent times, but we need more of that information. The third concern I have here, and I think the most important one, is the availability of peer review. If we, especially in the context of the endangered species filings, that if, if we are not able to have full peer review of the materials that are brought forward, I think it is going to hurt the credibility of what, what we're basing our science for. So I would respectfully argue that we listen to the technical committee here, um, do, do it once, you know, measure twice, cut once, do this for the 2017, and then have the assurance that we um, have taken advantage of what is available to us to make appropriate management decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bob Lou. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A, a key issue in my mind is how our assessment, whether it be a, something sooner rather than later, ties in with the uh, federal government's uh, schedule for revisiting the listing, which I understand is on a five-year cycle, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe I said that wrong, but it's something along the lines of once listed, that listing can't be revisited or wouldn't be revisited for at least five years. But come five years, there is a, a portal, if I understand, to uh, revisit. I would want to make sure that we take full advantage of that opportunity by providing whatever information we have at the earliest possible time to influence uh, a potential reconsideration and wouldn't, although I totally appreciate the, the sentiments just expressed about a peer-reviewed assessment getting the best available uh, information to the service, I, I'm, I'm challenged by the issue of delaying too much and by doing so not availing ourselves of the earliest opportunity to uh, encourage a revisiting of the listing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bob. And I think with, with both Galen and Angela here, if I misspeak, they'll correct me, but I, I believe that we could petition to have them delisted at any time. Um, but I, I do believe that, and Angela's coming up, so I'm not going to say any more until she corrects me. <laughs> No, that is correct. You could certainly petition a Angela Soma. I am the chief of the Endangered Species Division for the National Marine Fishery Service. You could certainly petition at any time. Um, there is a five-year review requirement. We did list Atlantic sturgeon in 2012, so in um, 2017 we will be obligated to do another review of the status to determine whether the, the current listing classification is accurate or whether it should be revised. But you uh, will also recall that NOAA Fisheries made a commitment that once this stock assessment was completed, even if that's before the time five-year time frame, that we would look at it and determine whether there was sufficient information there that would cause us to do a new status review even earlier than the five-year time frame. Thank you, Angela. And again, thank you for being here. We appreciate that. Um, so I'm certainly, I'm certainly, I certainly hear Katie loud and clear. Um, again, it's a priority. It's what's a priority for you and your staff and your state, um, you know, with, with this doing it both ways. Um, Walter? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Given what we just heard, I think it makes sense to uh, to do this once and do it right. And I don't think we're going to have a good enough stock assessment if we try and do it for next year. It's not going to be good enough information to change the listing status, and that's really what we need to do. Uh, you know, if it, if it's warranted, and we need good data, we need a good study. So I think it's do it once, do it right. Thank you, Walter. Dave Board. Yeah, I, I'm sensitive to the uh, staff concerns about, you know, workload, and, and I certainly don't want to impose any more work on the staff than is absolutely necessary, but I totally agree with the last comment that it's critical, uh, given the experience we've gone through over the last two years, to do this right. Uh, so I, I would support the 2017 timeline. Uh, but I'm not sure that we shouldn't do something in addition to that, Mr. Chairman, which is at some point convene a meeting of the Sturgeon Committee and discuss all of this, and maybe that committee can come up with uh, 
some uh, general proposals that we could put on the table to uh, try to mitigate some of the negative impacts on on the sturgeon population in the interim period so that we're actually doing something for sturgeon uh, conservation as we get this finer detail, which we need to, I mean, the, the detail that's going to come out of all this, this work is critical if we want to manage these species down to the river system basis. Uh, and that's, if we want to do justice to the management program, that's what we have to get to eventually. So I think maybe we should do both of those things. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Brandon? <clears throat> Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I I'm going to um, voice my support in doing the, the 2015 and the 2017 assessment, uh, knowing what kind of workload it's going to cause to staff and, and state staff to get this done. But I think uh, given the status of where North Carolina is with their permits and where all the other states are with their permits, which is nowhere, um, getting some information. It may be, it may not be exactly where we want it to be, which is what we want in 20, 2017, but I think the assessment could be good enough to give us a good idea of where we are with the sturgeon population. Much of this information that is, you know, in the Section 6 funding is already available. There are a number of years already done, so that new information could be added into this 2015 assessment. And it'll lay the groundwork for the 2017 assessment. The, all of the background information will be there. You have a baseline assessment to do to move forward with the 2017 assessment. And I think it'll add some you know, credence to what the states need to go through for, for their incidental take permits. will help out those states. And I think it's, we need to get a sense of where we are with this population now way to, you know, than, rather than longer. Thank you, Brandon. Um, Adam? I would support the comments of both as well, but I would just ask while we see two columns of a 2017 timeline checking more boxes than a 2015 timeline, if the 2015 assessment is a three star, does the 2017 get us to five stars or does it give us three and a half? How, how much more are we actually going to have in meaningful information to base management decisions and or inform the service about the merits of the listing from that 2017 timeline? I think the question is what level do you want to manage the species on? Do you want to treat it like it's a single coastwide stock or do you want to manage it down to individual river systems or state or DPS levels. The fact that I'm using DPS here should give you some clue as to how the fishery service sees it in that they are treating it as, as, as parts of a subpopulation, uh, as individual stocks. And our ability to provide you guys and to provide the service with a overall trend of, hey, Atlantic sturgeon on the coast are doing this, is that useful from either a management perspective related to the biology of the species or is that relevant to how the fishery service is assessing their endangered species status? Obviously I cannot speak to the latter, but I think the board should have an idea of how useful a coast-wide estimate is going to be if we need to manage the species on a stock specific level. There's very little we can do on a stock specific level with the data that we have now, but a lot more will become possible when these projects are completed and with additional work from the stock assessment subcommittee. Anyone else from the board that wants to speak to this? Richie? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't know if the service can comment, but uh, it might be interesting to hear uh, their take on uh, these two different assessments. Will the rushed assessment uh, possibly be enough for them to delist? Uh, you know, and if not, why would we waste you know all that effort? Uh, That's a very good, good question. And I would assume. Well, I'm sorry, Angel. I didn't see you there. Go ahead. I, I don't know that I could answer that question, and I, and I want to be clear. Our commitment was not that we would necessarily delist. Our commitment was that we would look at the stock assessment and the information in it at whatever point in time it came out and make a determination whether we would redo a status review, not that we would necessarily take action based on that stock assessment alone and move forward with a change in the listing. 
Um, uh, certainly, the information in there would be quite valuable. I, you know, it will end. Uh, it would. I can't answer that question until we actually see what the stock assessment looks like to know what information is there and how useful it could actually be, and whether it would trigger us to do another status review. Yeah, I guess my comment there would be that certainly it will be a tremendous amount more information than you had when the listing decision was made. So hopefully if all the things that we're hearing um, and all the reports that we are receiving will provide us with good information to get to that point. And, you know, I would encourage everyone to continue to move forward with their ITPs so that you can begin to collect the information that we're collecting in North Carolina. Um, we're getting a tremendous amount of abundance and distribution information, but also a, a very good, um, very good information on discards. Um, these things handle being captured in gill nets very, very well. Um, the, the discard mortality rates are extremely low for what we're what we're finding, and I think any of that any of that information that the other states can get can gather and provide for when we do a status review will be helpful. And while Angela's here, I will tell you that um, working with the Sturgeon Group, whatever they call themselves, at the Protected Resources section was a pleasure, and they worked really well with my staff. To, to get this thing done in what I think think is probably record time. So we now have two statewide ITPs, um, and this one did not take us nearly as long and was not nearly as arduous a task. So hopefully you all find that, and maybe we played the guinea pig and got the ball rolling, but I would certainly encourage everyone to move forward with their ITPs. Anything else from the board before I go? Dave, uh, Bob, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I just want to, there was a teaser a minute ago regarding uh, the opportunity for the commission to request reconsideration at any time, not necessarily after uh, waiting for that five-year mandatory review. So to me, there is perhaps an opportunity here to consider, uh, and I'm not sure how viable this would be, but consider a request uh, sometime between now and 2017, assuming we go forward with the, with the full assessment for 2017, that would provide an update uh, with regard to the additional data that is available uh, as sort of an interim approach to not necessarily doing an assessment, doing two assessments, but rather providing the service with the information that's become available since the listing uh, with a request to consider, uh, consider the status uh, pending the follow-up full assessment that now looks to be targeted for 2017. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, anything we can do, I think you wouldn't get an objection from me. I don't know what the... I don't know what the technical requirements would be of having to put all of that information together, but as opposed to a stock assessment, I mean, it may be just as arduous a task to put all the information together and summarize it as it would be to assess the stock. I don't know, but that's a good, good, good potential. Um, and at least I think, but I think Angel, Angel is aware of our need and what we want to do. Um, our goal is to try to get these things delisted through good, sound data and analysis. And I think if we can provide that to National Marine Fishery Service, I think we have a chance. Um, if we, if I were them, I probably would wait on the 2017 assessment, which has got all the new and the best information involved in it. But at the same time, if there was overwhelming evidence you know, that goes contrary to the listing decision, they may be able to get the ball rolling early. I just don't know, and I don't think Angela can tell us, but maybe she can. Well, I was just going to I mean, whatever, if the um, commission does a any form of a stock assessment in 2015, we certainly are going to look at it and evaluate it. I don't think you would need, you certainly wouldn't need to submit some kind of a formal request or a petition for us to do that. We've been working with the Commission all along on the stock assessment. We're as interested in the information as you all are. So whatever comes out in 2015, if there is 
some form of a stock assessment, we certainly will be looking at it very carefully to see whether that alone would be enough for us to do another status review. And certainly any and all information, I mean, this isn't the only information that's being, um, and research that's being done on, on Atlantic Surgeon. We are certainly constantly collecting and you know, we did fund a lot of this work through our Section 6 program. That is an Endangered Species Act program. We were funding some, <clears throat> excuse me, Atlantic sturgeon work prior to the listing, but listed species get priority under Section 6, so that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of research going on now. We've heard, you know, loud and clear about the data gaps that went into the listing, and we're trying to close some of those data gaps, so we're certainly um, going to take a very close look at, at whatever comes out in 2015 if there is some form of a stock assessment. And um, related to the incidental take permits, I did want to thank Lewis for his kind comments. Um, he is correct so far. We've had two states come in, Georgia and North Carolina. And I just want to um, encourage other states to continue to work on that and reiterate our commitment. And I think Lewis has affirmed that we've lived up to that commitment. If you're willing to work with us and really work on trying to come up with a conservation plan, we have committed the staff resources and time to work on it and try and get it through the process in an expeditious manner. Thanks. And you have done that, and I appreciate that. Um, so with that said from National Marine Fisheries Service, and with the expectation, understanding that they will be looking at the data just like we will be, they will be involved with, I assume, the technical committee, the stock assessment committees have got National Marine Fishery Service staff on board. I think if we get the silver bullet in 2015, then great. But it's sounding to me around the table that the majority are looking at the 2017 assessment in order to, you know, really be the anchor behind our request to delist unless something happens before then that we feel comfortable with our partners to move forward with. Is that a fair characterization of where we are at this point? So is there any objection to that being the direction to staff moving forward? That was what they were primarily asking us for was that direction. Just one. Is that everybody's in agreement on that? Seeing no objections, then that's the way we will proceed. Um, yeah, it's it's very important that that we as state directors and and others to to make sure that our staff are available and are are participating and and helping. Um, compile all this information. Otherwise, our other assessments are going to suffer for it. But I think we all understand and agree that this is a priority issue for our stock assessment staff. And so any additional help you can provide is would be much appreciated. So with that, what I'd like to do is go ahead and, and break for lunch. We'll, I know, we'll start back. We'll start back with this after lunch, and then we'll go right into the business meeting, and it'll be sort of seamless, I think, in order to do that, unless there's objection from Bob. All right, so with that, we will stand in recess until um, 1.30. For those folks that are going 